Um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Carissa Brown Otter and I will be presenting today. Uh, my title is Food Security in Uncertain Times. And uh, let me just introduce myself a little bit um, for those of you who may not know me. I saw a couple names of people I do know, but I'll just give my full introduction um, so everyone gets acquainted. Yat e she Carissa Browner Yinishe, Torichini Nishli, Hunkpapa Lakota Bashishin, Kiani Dashiche Do Hunkpapa Lakota Dashinelli. Good afternoon. My name is Carissa Brown Otter. And I am a graduate student at NDSU. I am finishing up my master's in public health right now with a specialization in American Indian public health. Um, I also work at the emergency food pantry. I am currently the interim warehouse manager right now. And um, I'm originally from um, Standing Rock, um, Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota. And um, my undergrad degrees in, in civil engineering, structural engineering, um, yeah, so I've I've kind of been in a, a lot of different um, positions, but I think my overall uh, area of expertise and area that I like to focus on um, is indigenous communities, um, specifically wellness and helping um, people have their basic necessities, and that sort of led me into food. So that's how I kind of got involved at the emergency food pantry. Um, I joined there when um, the COVID pandemic was starting and um, sort of man maneuvered through different positions. Um, and now I'm currently helping with uh, the warehouse maintenance right now. So it's, it can be stressful there, um, but I love what I do. And um, just wanted to do a little plug in the background of this uh, beginning slide. Um, that's a little bit of artwork that I've done um, during a, like a mental health workshop. Um, it's Nada, which is uh, Navajo for corn. Um, so they were asking us to, to draw an expression of something that, that gives you life. And um, back on the Navajo Nation, when I was living down there, um, corn means a lot um, to um, my Diné relatives and down in the Southwest. Corn um, is a way of life. Um, there's a lot of cultural meanings behind it. So I was trying to incorporate that here um, in my, my talk about food security. So let's get started. So um, what is food security? Um, I decided to use the United Nations definition of food security as they are like a global institution and they're specializing or at least have a lot of uh, policies and policy recommendations in regard to food security and global food security. Um, so their definition is all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets, that meets their food preferences and dietary needs for an active and healthy group. So um, when we're talking about food security, um, you also need to look at the flip side, um, like if people are food secure, what is the opposite of that? Um, and that would be food insecurity. So what does it mean to be food insecure? Um, and this question right here sort of brings me into um, my own personal experiences. Um, I've been, you know, in situations where I have been food insecure, and I think that really brings um, this home to me and like working at the emergency pantry in town um, of being food insecure. Like I have that personal experience, gro not only growing up um, as my father was going to school, um, you know, and, and there were times where we didn't have food on the table or, you know, you, you were hungry, going to bed hungry. But this has also happened to me as I was like a, a student, you know, waiting for scholarships to come through um, and that in between time before you get money, um, you know, you, you don't have enough to make ends meet. So, like, there are several ways of defining food insecurity. Um, and when we're talking about food insecurity, 
Um, there are like several that the USDA measures. Um, they give out an annual survey um, to people across the United States measuring what is food insecurity. And um, some of those include questions in their survey regarding like food intake reductions. So like reducing how much food you're eating, um, you know, reducing your, your meal sizes, um, how much food or you're skipping meals, even that's the disrupted eating patterns, like skipping food that uh, you may not be usually eating if you were food secure. Um, weight loss is also a measure. And then feeling hungry, but you're not eating um, because you're you're not having enough food access at that time. So you you're say like you're going to bed hungry. And then also the anxiety portion of that. So like being worried that your the amount of food that you have um, may not last. So I'll say your next paycheck. So these are like some of the different types of conditions um, that you can be feeling when you're food insecure. And when we're connecting food security, food insecurity, and you know the indigenous populations around here, we have to talk about why um, a lot of our indigenous communities are suffering from food insecurity, and even our own, um, you know, fellow urban natives who live in this area. Like, why? Why is this the way it is right now? You know, why are there people who are hungry? Um, why are some of our indigenous communities not getting enough food? You know, why is this a situation that we're dealing with right now? So you have to look back um, across the timeline to see what has happened um, to get us to today. And one of those things to look at is the disruption of our food systems. So this picture right here, um, this is very depressing to me. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, even just a couple hundred years ago, there used to be millions of buffalo roaming across this land right here, right now. And um, not even 150 years ago, there were um, sort of policies enacted rules so that the disruption of those food systems will happen. And one of those ways is killing off um, buffalo because a lot of northern tribes who live up here on the Great Plains survived on buffalo. And, you know, disrupting that food system um, is, is a tactic that can be used to um, assimilate indigenous peoples. Uh, this photo right here, it just, it, it moves me because um, my family, we were buffalo ranchers. And, um, you know, seeing this photo, it like really makes me really sad because, you know, this is this is a way of life. The Tatanka, it's, it's a connection um, to the survival. It's it's it has so many significant. It's it has spiritual significance, cultural significance. Um, yeah, it means a lot. And just seeing this, oh, it it really uh, just makes makes me feel sad because this right here is is an example of how we ended up where we are today. So giving the historical context of why um, there is food insecurity, um, especially in our indigenous populations, we can tie it back to the disruption of our way of life. And one of the big ways that that has happened is through colonization and forced assimilation and, you know, really the, the genocide of indigenous peoples that has happened here on this land. The, those disruption of food systems um, still has impact to this day on the people living here. And, you know, these are just some of the examples of, of things that have happened um, in, in American history. Um, forced relocation of people is another example of how our food systems have been disrupted. Um, personally, some of my family members, like, especially on, if we're talking about 
so there's two thoughts here we're talking about um you know me personally some of my family members you know we're forced to relocate um into urban settings so being far away from your homelands um disrupts how you've learned to to survive um off the land um so being in a, in a location that's foreign you know you may not know how to survive in that situation and then the forced relocation of people's just onto reservations like that's another example as well where our people used to roam across um, the northern plains and forcing them onto a smaller tract of land and expecting them to farm um that's like a, a way of disrupting um, how we used to live. And then another example would be the assimilation tactics used to um, assimilate people into um, Western society. So that connects with like um, boarding schools and um, ways of learning what methods to farm the land as opposed to um, letting the animals roam, like the buffalo roaming across the lands. Like these are some of the examples of things that have gotten us to where we are today. And the impacts of not only these things, but other um, other policies and implementations that have happened over time can be seen um, to this day. And this is just a, a short list. You know, I, I could talk on for, you know, couple hours about just the implications alone of what has happened to indigenous people due to those disruptions to our food systems. Um, so these are these are some of the things that have happened um, due to you know being forced onto like one tract of land and you know being forced to assimilate has had phenomenal impacts on the loss of language and culture and knowledge, as well as um, the lack of accessibility you may have to to areas that you may have previously, um, you know, foraged or or gotten other food sources from those areas, and um, the poverty is astounding. Um, you can see it with your if you're ever back home, and then just the ongoing trauma as well as like the historical and intergenerational trauma that you feel from losing your language, from losing your culture, from losing that knowledge of how you have how um you used to move through the land and be connected with the land. Um that still is ongoing to this day, like losing those things. And then that's not even including like the violence that has happened um to our relatives and our ancestors. In addition, there are other um, health issues that that are associated with the disruption of food systems and, you know, being food insecure. Um, you can have adverse health outcomes like physical health outcomes as well as mental health difficulties as well. Um, there are ties between depression and anxiety um, related to being food insecure. And those uh, can impact every other one of these um, areas that I've listed up here. In terms of physical um, health outcomes, the food that you eat, um, you know, food food is sacred. And like, if you're putting foods that aren't, um, that, that aren't healing to your body, you know, you can definitely impact um, your health. And we see that to this day with the, uh, high rates of type 2 diabetes and the obesity rates, um, not only on our reservations, but the urban natives as well who live in our um, metropolitan areas. And these uh, these little stats here, um, I found these pretty significant. In um, one of the studies I was reading, there is significantly higher food insecurity amongst urban natives compared to rural natives. So in this study, they were checking out the USDA surveys. Um, this was about five years ago. And in urban households, 80% of those urban natives who were, who were interviewed in this survey, 80% of them were experiencing food insecurity. 
um, compared to those who may have been living more in rural areas, um, which includes like uh, rural reservations where they're experiencing about 45%. But some of the other studies I've seen, some reservations are experiencing um, food insecurity as high as 75%. So this 45% isn't inclusive of every single reservation. This is uh, just a snapshot of some of the uh, people who were surveyed. Um, but you know that that uh, acknowledging how significant food insecurity is within our indigenous communities um, is real. And if we're talking local in Cass Clay counties, um, AI or American Indian households are significantly more likely to use the pantry. And I got this from the Great Plains Food Bank. They did a survey two years ago where they were surveying American Indians um, as well as other uh, populations, but you, you had to mark um, your ethnicity or your race in the survey. And those who are using pantries, um, there are only about 2% um, indigenous people who are living in North Dakota, um, which is the service area of the Great Plains Food Bank. But out of that 2%, when we're looking at how many households are using pantries, nearly 10% of those who are using the pantries are native. So we see a significant amount, a significant proportion more of natives in those, um, in the pantry setting versus uh, people who are non-native as well. So moving past the the depressing things, because um, that stuff just it makes me feel really sad talking about um, all of the negative aspects. If we're looking back at at um, the negatives, you know, that are happening within my community. Um, this makes me really sad. So I'd like to, you know, to look forward and look into um, what is happening and where are we going from here? And I think this is where we should put a lot of our focus. Um, like understanding where we came from in the context is important, but also looking into the future generations um, and seeing where we can take our community in the future. Um, I think that that's really important, especially for youth um, and you know our future generations. So uh, these are. I'm not going to say that I'm an expert, but this is uh, what I've seen in um, some of the studies that I've researched, um, as well as uh, what I've seen um, in my communities that I've seen um, work and help have people. Um, feel more connected and feel more in touch and also help reduce food insecurity. In other words, helping people feel more secure um, with their food. So these are some of the uh, some of the directions that I think um, we need to go in order to reduce food insecurity and help us feel more secure. So the first one I think is one of the most important and that is food sovereignty. And this stretches beyond um, just food access alone. So at the emergency food pantry, we are uh, very specific in um, addressing the emergent need, like the immediate need that you have in needing food. And um, you know, this direction of food sovereignty moves beyond just looking at the immediate direct need. And that is uh, looking at more of the bigger picture and looking at the relations between uh, indigenous peoples and the land and the knowledge that you know regarding the food in the area, the sacred food. And um, when I was living on the Navajo Nation, there was a there's a huge food sovereignty movement happening while I was living there. And hearing um, the leaders, the community leaders, and hearing um, the people um, around the area you know, sharing the knowledge and sharing um, what we know and sharing um, what is and, you know, why things are um, existing, like the, the plants, um, how those plants can help you live, knowing um, what to do during certain seasons, um, planting seasons, and just like understanding um, how certain foods can help you um, sharing those things like that um, 
those are aspects of food sovereignty, but, you know, it, it goes beyond that. And there's also like policy implications too. Um, so, you know, focusing on, on food sovereignty and, and having that access um, is important. In addition, the cultural connections. So like the more, you know, about uh, where you come from, the more, you know, about the foods that, um, are part of your culture and what they mean, the significance of those foods. Um, that helps you feel more connected. I know for myself personally, learning more about my people, my um, Diné relatives and learning about the foods that are um, indigenous to that place, you know, it helped my mental health. It helped me feel more connected to who I am and who, what it means to be a Diné woman. And um, the same goes with like my Lakota side, like understanding um, what the buffalo means to you, like what what aspects of the buffalo, like um, how how does that heal you? Um, like learning those things helps you feel more tied um, to the earth, to um, you know your spirituality, um, feeling more um, at peace um, with your existence on this land. Um, Side note, the little picture of the buffalo, um, that's one of uh, my buffaloes. So I, I took that picture out um, on our buffalo ranch. But um, coming back, so promoting traditional and local foods, I think that that is another direction um, that we should be going, um, especially like in more urban settings. This is because um, a lot of these that I've described, like you can see those um, in rural settings, but we are living in an in a urban setting here. so promoting the traditional and local foods of this land um, is a direction that I think that we should go and like looking into what was here prior to colonization, what was here um, and what is here, uh, not just use past tense, what is here um, and what um, what do those foods mean? Like what um, what is the significance of the plants, of the animals um, in this area? In the, in the sense of a, a bigger picture here, looking at the environmental policies in place, um, not only in this area, but just uh, in general across the US, you know, looking into to revising those policies so that we promote access to both the land and food um, is key. So there are some policies in place that, that limit um, your, your opportunities to to forage um, to look for medicinal plants um, so like you know if if you want to forage having best practices for uh, letting um, letting those who understand the, the plants and the foods letting them be able to to look into those resources um, and be able to use them in a respectful manner um, that would be nice and then uh sustainability of our resources, um, making sure that we have environmental policies in place that allow us to have um, safe, um, safe, I don't wanna say policies, but like safe access to our land, to our water, um, to the, the plants, anything that, um, is in those areas, like making sure that the policies that are in place will help sustain those regions for the future generations. So we don't want to hurt Mother Earth, but you want to be able to, to have other people in the future experience that land um, as it is and letting other future generations be able to access those um, plants and animals as well. So making sure that environmental policies in place help um, make sure that that happens. One uh, study that I was reading was um, describing how a lot of the social protection policies um, that have been put in place during COVID have kept the food insecurity um, stable. So 
Um, during COVID, it was expected that food insecurity would skyrocket due to job loss, workforce job loss, um, being you know stuck um, in your home or you're be you're sick with illness. But the some of the social protection policies that were um, both the the financial um, the the checks that we got, like both of those, the, you know, the 1500 that you got from the government, as well as um, increasing the amount of money that you got from SNAP, um, those social nets helped keep food insecurity stable for the general population. Like it, it didn't skyrocket, although some smaller communities were impacted, negatively impacted overall the food insecurity um, did not skyrocket. And so by supporting those social webs that help support people who may not otherwise have the financial means to access food, um, that can help um, reduce food insecurity. In other words, help people become more food secure if they have the financial means um, to access that food that you need. And then um, collaborating with existing structures. There, I've learned through uh, my public health studies that there are a lot of structures that currently exist, but I feel like a lot of us are doing similar work, but it, it you know, talking to each other, um, there's some difficulties at times, or there's a, like the silo effect where, you know, this person's doing this job and this person's doing this job, but having collaboration so that we're not, you know, writing the same book. We're all, you know, making sure that our community is supported and that we're we're doing things that um, that help create uh, cohesion in our communities. So finding ways to have those structures talk to each other and work together, um, that is a direction that we need to go. So increasing that collaboration. And if we're looking um, specifically at our Cass Clay County, our Fargo Moorhead County, um, these are some of the uh, recommendations, some of the tips, some of the next steps I believe would be best for our community. And um, the first one, like the overarching goal here is to improve the wellness of our community members. So improving our community wellness um, to get there. You know, these are some of the things that we need to focus on. One of those being um, owning our community and, you know, feeling a sense of connection with those around you. You know, this, these are my community members. You know, this is like my family. Like when, when, where I come from um, on the Santa Ana Reservation, our, our Oyate, like those are the people that you connect with. Um, and here in this community, you know, creating that, that sense of, you know, helping each other like that helps um, can help in the, you know, when, when people are feeling food insecure, having someone to reach out to having someone, um, you know, to help you during those times of need. Um, one of the uh, articles I found um, was describing the difference between urban natives and rural natives and um, it was describing how in rural households, those who live on the reservation, um, they have those extensive family networks. And so when someone feels in need of food, they can reach out to relatives, you know, ask for help, being able to reach out to those around them um, so that there is enough food to go around. Um, urban natives, they were expressing a different sentiment saying they they felt more isolated and didn't have as much community to reach out to didn't have um, as much of those social um, supports um, in their area and i think here in the fargo morgan community we can um, work together to try to have that sense of ownership have that sense of collaboration in our community um, one of those i've been hearing a lot from some of my colleagues at the emergency food pantry, um, and especially some of the volunteers, um, our community gardens that some of them are creating. Um, there's some, I think, on the north side of town, 
and then there's one like in the lot right next to the emergency food pantry. Um, so having community gardens um, is just one example of having, you know, that sort of sense of collaboration that, you know, we're in this together and, and we're going to help each other. Um, other ideas are, are some of the interventions and uh, programs. So I was thinking like having access to those healthy foods that are traditionally and culturally appropriate. So at the emergency food pantry, we are looking into this right now. Um, we are trying to increase our access to foods that um, are traditionally and culturally appropriate, not only for indigenous people, but for for new Americans, for refugees, for those who you know may be coming from other communities. Finding ways to have those foods of access the access to those foods available to those people, um, to anyone from any culture, like that is um, of importance for us at the, at the pantry. And so we're working towards finding ways so that we have the financial means to be able to offer those to people who, who want those, um, you know, just giving them access to those healthy foods. Um, another, is a uh, nutrition training. So just learning, um, and this isn't just for our community members, but for, for leaders as well. And, and those who, who are advocating for healthy foods, just having access to, to, to training, whether they be uh, workshops or, you know, classes, like learning how not only just like, um, mainstream nutrition, but we're I want to talk also about like, foods that are traditional to this land and understanding the the aspects of those um, foods and what it means when you eat those. So looking at like um, this picture that I have, so this is when I was working at the Navajo Nation, we were making um, a trail mix for, uh, to distribute to our youth leaders. So they were making um, these different uh, mixes together. So we have like pumpkin seeds, we had, um, baked, kind of, they're kind of like the, the corn nuts, uh, but they use the blue corn from home. So we, they bake the blue corn to make like corn nuts. Um, we have like the pinyon seeds from the trees. And then we added some other, uh, other foods that you can find at the supermarket, like almonds or cranberries. Um, so this was like, uh, just an example of like, we talked at, during that class, we were talking about like the significance of each of these, you know, half of those being from items that are from our community. And then the other half are things that you could find, like, say, at the supermarket. So, like, learning what does it mean when you put these into your body? You know, how can you access these around you? Um, just like having um, ways to learn that knowledge and still be able to, to access that traditional knowledge. And with that, you know, having other classes and workshops where you can learn, um, learn other, other ways of preparing food, other ways of, of harvesting food or, or gathering food. So I was thinking like my mom, she loves to can. So like, how do you can, <laughs> you know, she has this garden and like how, how, what is the process of canning food so that you can have them? at a later time during the winter time or during the early spring, we, you may not have access to those fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so just like um, having classes and workshops here, like I think a lot of our community members would be interested. Um, so like having those here would be nice. And then um, I mentioned before, but I'm gonna mention it again, like strengthening those relationships that we already have. So strengthening existing, um, programs, existing uh, networks, existing organizations, like helping each other collaborate um, would help um, in uh, helping Fargo have become stronger together. And then um, a lot of the research kept describing coping strategies. And I, for me, when I hear coping strategies, I think like from a mental health perspective, like, you know, your breathing exercises and like um, exercising. So like, how do you cope with stress? Like that was my relation to understanding this. But as I read more, it was, how do you survive if you don't have food? And that's what I mean by coping strategies. Like, what do you do if you're in a situation where you're food insecure? 
you're hungry, you don't have access to healthy quality foods, what do you do? And so some of the strategies that we could have um, are community resources. At the emergency food pantry, we have um, this little pamphlet um, that we received from the Great Plains Food Bank that has a list of all the local food pantries um, and like the soup kitchens and any of the churches or organizations who host like dinners, um, they're all listed on this little pamphlet, like on by weekday. And just like that resource alone, you know, I've heard from many of the clientele that we serve, how that has helped them um, through the month or through um, the year, especially during those times of need. Um, so like strengthening those as well, having those options, but also strengthening those options. And then, um, Another plug for the emergency food pantry, just like having access to those foods, being able to visit those pantries who may be able to assist you during that time. Um, that's what we could do here in Fargo Moorhead. And then um, the question, you know, so this is like community, and I know that this can feel like a lot. Like I'm going to go back. This is like bigger picture. We're talking, you know, larger scale. We go here, this is community level, you know, community scale. And you're thinking, wow, this is a lot. I don't have a lot of time or, you know, may, I may not have a lot of resources, but what can I do? Like, I, I want to make some change in my community. What can I do personally? And these are some of the ideas of what you can do yourself to help support your own community and help, you know, people feel food, food secure. First is like letting people know that this happens. Like this doesn't exist elsewhere. It's here in our own community in Fargo Moorhead. There are people who are hungry here right now. So like spreading that awareness that, you know, we need to support those who live in our community, those not only indigenous people, but everywhere around, you know, help, um, you know, foster um, that sense of community and support and like have people have their basic needs met. One of those being you know, food, access to food. If you have the financial means, being able to donate to your local nonprofits um, and also to, you know, the food pantries or the, the missions who, who may be trying to bridge those um, areas where the need is great. Volunteering is huge. If you ever have free time, please come to the emergency food pantry because we need volunteers. Prior to the COVID pandemic, we most of our volunteers were um, people who uh, retired. Um, so they're above the age of 65. Um, and as the COVID pandemic swept through um, our, our region, we lost lots of volunteers. Um, and we, our volunteer numbers are still low to this day. So if you have time, um, please come and help us because um, we serve people from all walks and ages and the help is dire. So if you have the moment or the time, please just come just for an hour, two hours. Um, you know, that is much appreciated, um, especially in our organization, but you know, there are other organizations too, if you don't feel like coming to the pantry. Um, if you have the means and, and you're, you're feeling really passionate, you know, organize, like help, um, you know, if you can make something happen in this community and in your community, you can help um, organize and, and find ways to help others be food secure. And lastly, um, support policies that uh, create that financial support web as well as supporting policies that affect the environment in a, in a positive manner um, and any other means that help um, people access food. So these are, these are some of the ways um, that you personally um, can do to help people be food secure. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to just kind of open it up to questions, comments, um, and yeah, sorry, I was rushing a little bit. I got like really stressed at first because, um, you know, the technical difficulties got me a little stressed out here. Uh, but I'm gonna kind of go back to some of the some of the when I was explaining studies. Here are some of the studies that I was um, describing earlier in my presentation. 
Um, and like I mentioned before, the artwork at the beginning page was by me, so I put artwork by myself. So going back, um, any questions or comments from anyone? I don't even know if anyone can talk or either that or you don't have any questions. I'm not sure. Hey, Krissa, can you hear me? This is Karen. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks for your presentation. Um, yeah. Are you okay if I put a link into the Goods for the Herd food pantry that we have on campus? Yeah, that'd put be a great. Link in the chat. Okay, I'll do that. Um, and there's all information about when they're open, where they're located, and how to access it. So. Awesome presentation, though. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I was a little stressed, everyone. <laughs> you did great. Oh. How do I stop sharing my screen? Oh, here we go. Hi, Carissa, can you hear me? Yes. This is Andrea. Oh, hi, Andrea. Awesome Good job. Good Thank you so much. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, because you, you provided a lot of different ways that we can be helping out um, in our communities. I'm wondering, what are your thoughts in addressing these types of issues to kind of, um, I don't want to say normalize them, but it's always something that happens to somebody else, right? But uh, food insecurity is so common. It's more common than we think in our communities. How can we get the word out that this isn't just something that's happening to somebody else? It's happening to our neighbors. It's happening to our friends. It's happening to our coworkers. You know, how can we be educating people about that? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm thinking from like an NDSU standpoint, um, a lot of our own students are food insecure. <laughs> um, I see a lot of students from Concordia, from MSUM, um, that come through our, our pantry doors um, every month. So this is something that I see happening all the time. Um, and I think maybe there's a stigma um, attached to, to being food insecure and there's, there's a feeling of, of maybe even shame related to to food insecurity um, but i think talking about it helps sort of bridge that and if people have experienced it you know just you know talking to those around you about it and even when you're volunteering too if you were to volunteer um you hear stories you know just about people who are there and the people who are being affected um and even interacting with the clientele you know, it brings it home that this is right at our front doorstep. Um, this is a problem that's affecting everyone. Um, and I think if we start to talk about it and, you know, when you feel this so close to people that you know and people that you care about, um, you know, it sort of opens your eyes that at any moment, I may become food insecure. If my neighbor has become food insecure, like this may happen to me as well. Um, so, yeah, I think just talking about it and like, you know, get putting your time out there into the community, you, you see it firsthand, um, which, which brings it home too. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi, Carissa. Um, I have okay. a question. More and more a statement. Um, I'm Gerald Grover. I'm the development director at Churches United, um, and we have um, food pantries and homeless shelters. And we are just now um, changed our location at the Dorothy Day Food Pantry in West Fargo. And I was going to see if I could share a link to that because um, it has the um, the times and such like that. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be okay. Can you put it in the chat? Yeah, so we have we have the Dorothy Day Food Pantry that's in Moorhead, and then we have one in West Fargo. It was originally um, hosted in the bus barn at Holy Cross Church, but last year it got too big for everyone, um, and so now we have a no, new location that lets us have longer hours. Um, we did 1.2 million pounds of food through the food pantry in West Fargo last year. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> Hi, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hey, hi. Thank you, Carissa. That was a, a wonderful presentation. As you were talking, it was like you were just speaking my heart and, um, oh, you know, my vision. So thank you so much. And so I'm going to be very specific in my question, and some of them, I don't know if I should ask it here, but you mentioned, I was looking at, you know, how can we, what, can, you know, not just what can we do, but some of the ways to improve, improve the situation, some of the inter intervention programs. And one of the key things we were talking about is strengthening existing networks. And uh, you talked about training you know, nutrition training. Actually, those are some of the aspects I'm looking at in my in my research work, which I'm working with Dr. Gramboid. And the key thing we're looking at, we're looking at the eating habits of the natives, like what they were eating before, what they eat, you know, what they're eating now and how it can be improved because food sovereignty, right? And we start breaking it down. And so one of the things is, Hey, personally, I'm because I'm researching what they used to eat, different foods like the berries, different berries, the three mm -hmm. sisters, the the bee, you know, the bees and the rest of them. But my question is, you talk about the food pantry, and I'm glad you're really working there because yes, the food pantry can help them, but that's why I said I'm very careful. I don't know if I should ask that question here. Because number one, the food pantry provides food for them. Like we could easily get food from there, but how healthy is the food? That's why I, I'm saying so. And that's kind of what I'm looking at. How can we partner with these people, uh, the pantries, to provide this healthy food? You know, to ensure that to, food food availability is one thing and it's important. Hey, thank you know. Then creator that you know that have, but then the other thing which is my major concern is how healthy. You get my question? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. no, that's that's a great question. Um, and it's actually ideas that I have. I'm sorry, two ideas that I have because I just wanted to ask. I the second part of that question is one of the ideas I have because already you said existing organizations, right? existing networks yeah like the station office do provide food so one of the things uh, you know we're trying to do i made those contacts before covid but since after covid it's just been you know everybody like you said everybody's trying to so the station office already have existing educational uh resources okay so then I and mean, we've already talked to them about how we can have some kind of education that is channel towards one native americans and two towards providing those healthy resources to you know making sure they are available and another thing that i did was where during the summer okay where you know just a few weeks a few days away i worked with a farm the, the community farm which the extension office were also part of well when I when I was working there, you you know it was mostly there was no Native Americans, right? There was uh, some Caucasians. But my point here is that how I don't know if they have something a farm going on like that in this Fabo Mohead community. Maybe there is, okay. And then if there is, after the farming and all that, I know there's. I think either you mentioned canning and all that. Is there something like that going on, canning and all that, so that at the end, these things can be taken to the food pantry as well as share with the people and all that. I know I have almost like four questions that I don't know if you picked all, but those are things I'm just curious about. I don't know if you have answers to them or, you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start with your first question and then I'll end with your second question. Um, in response to your first question, um, so the, the question being, uh, let me think back to what you were saying. Because you, you have two questions here. Um, first question related to how healthy is the food that you're giving out um, to the community? Yes. yes, that is a good question. Um, so the food pantry has been around for, 50, we've been around for 50 years next year. Um, so approaching our 50th anniversary, the executive director, Stacy, she's been um, really adamant to to look forward in our strategic planning to where do we go now into the future? So she's looking forward 
and you know there are foods that aren't healthy that we do give out like that um that happens but it doesn't have to be that way and so the question being how can we change this so that we are offering those foods that are quality um to our community um and one of the first steps um, that she wants to take, which also is going to be my practicum for uh, my master's in public health degree, is looking into um, what are the community needs um, and what what are the foods that you would like access to if you were in need of food. Um, and so for my practicum, I'm specifically addressing um, the American Indian population here in the Fargo Moorhead area in Cass Clay. Um, and I'll be conducting uh, like a survey to ask and also a focus group to ask those questions of like, what do you need? And, you know, it doesn't necessarily just have to be food either. There are other aspects um, that are, it's all interrelated to um, food insecurity and like what what is needed? What from the community do you need so that you can live a healthy life and be well? Um, what are those needs? Um, so. Yeah, Stacy, I, I love working for her. Um, she really wants to to give what is best to the community um, and the pantry. And it doesn't have to be like a traditional pantry. We can offer other resources and help, you know, make those connections um, to other organizations as well that are in this community. So um, the first step, I guess, is just trying to figure out what what should we offer? Um, what are what are the foods that that people are looking for? as well as what are um, the resources um, that are needed in order to have a healthy community here in Fargo-Moorhead. The second question um, related to what's happening now, like in relation to like gardens and whatnot, um, a lot of the ones that I've heard through the volunteers that have been working um, are smaller, not as big as like a larger, you know, well-known community garden, but there are small pockets that are um, being created. And um, I'm trying to remember the name of the program. Uh, it's an organization of people who have gardens who bring their fresh produce to the pantry um, and they put it under the same organization. I can't, it's, if I can think of it, I'll let you know, Vivian. Um, but, you going together? What's that? Is it growing together? Uh, no. Oh, no. Okay, that's a different. Um, but yeah, but they bring their produce in, and so we've had over several hundred pounds of produce wow. just this season alone um, that we've been distributing out, and that's not including like the pumpkins and the cantaloupe and the muscamelons that we've been receiving as well. So I'm talking like the smaller, the squash, you know, the the tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, the smaller products. So we've been receiving um, a lot of fresh produce um, yeah. from across our entire county. Um, and I, I hope that we continue doing that. Uh, so it's happening. Um, I guess what I'm hoping is maybe we can strengthen it so that we, we get more um, and we're able to distribute more um, and maybe more diverse um, produce out to our community members. Thank you so much. I guess I'll... I'll follow up with you to see how I can volunteer. <laughs> yes, please. We need volunteers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> well, we're at uh two thirty. So, um, if you have any other questions, please email me. My email is Carissa Brownotter at gmail dot com. Um, and I want to thank all of you for for being here with me. Um, sorry, I was a little stressed at the beginning. Uh, uh, technical difficulties, they always get me a little stressed. So thanks for bearing in there with me and like sticking it through with me. Um, I'm glad to have been able to have this experience of sharing um, what I know um, with all of you. And um, I hope that I continue to keep learning about this um, and continue to continue to impact our community because um, yeah, that's just sort of like who I am. I, I like to help others. So being able to to serve a purpose in the Fargo Moorhead community um, has meant a lot to me. So thanks all for listening to me. <laughs>